Hey folks, Pastor Jim Thomas from the Village Chapel here in Nashville, Tennessee with your daily devotional. Love these Advent season devotionals. And uh, today I want to read once again from Advent in all of the scriptures. It's called Rejoice and uh, the subtitle Advent in all the scriptures. And this is put together by Chris Wright, who as a protege of John Stott. John, one of my very favorite Bible teachers and pastors, uh, really a hero of mine from a distance, um, and uh, uh, one that I read quite often and quote quite often, who's gone home to be in glory with the Lord. But Chris Wright has done such a great job picking up that mantle and uh, carrying on with the Langham Partnership and some of these other ministry initiatives that John started, and one of which is uh, Langham Literature, and that's where you get one of these from, and a great ministry that they have around the world, actually, making sure to train and equip pastors to um, be able to teach the Bible and and be able to share the good news of the gospel. So this particular writing is uh, uh, draws from a, a, a passage and an idea that looks more toward the second advent, second appearing of Christ. And we talk about that, haven't we, in, uh, in church and in these devotionals, that advent is a, uh, it's all about the once and future coming of Jesus Christ. That is, he came once, uh, the first time he came uh, as a servant, laid down his life on the cross paid the price for our sins, burst forth from the grave, defeating our last and greatest enemy, and ascended back into heaven. But before he did, he promised to return, to come a second time, and to set things right in this broken world, which I don't know about you, but man, I'm, I, I long for that more and more as the days grow darker and darker around us, as the world seems uh, so intellectually confused and morally bankrupt, as there's so much <clears throat> anger and, <clears throat> and violence. And there's so much um, that, that seems broken that we can't do anything about. We've tried not enough money, not enough education in the world to do, to fix all of this. And so we need outside help. And the great news is he, he who came once in the first century has promised to come again. And so this chapter is called The God Who Came As Promised. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, is something that we pray. Um, uh, and indeed we do that. We read at the end of the the verse-by-verse -verse study we did through the book of Revelation. I was so glad we did that uh, book. And then we'll swing into the book of Genesis uh, at the start of the year 2021. This is, I'm recording this in 2020. I don't know when you're watching this, but um, I love the idea that we have, you know, this thread, this narrative that runs from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And we've studied Revelation, now we're going back to Genesis. And, and we're going to see some of the same stuff. It's going to be, it's, it's like if you pull a thread th in, in one of those books, the entire Bible crinkles up, all the pages crinkle up because it's actually all connected to beginning to end. And it's all about Christ and he, the fact that he has come. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, we pray. We long for the second advent of our Lord and Savior. And why? Surely because the terrible mess our world is in. The overwhelming tide of wickedness and suffering of international tensions, along with the seeming acceleration of natural disasters and the extremes of global climate breakdown, make us long more and more for Christ to come and to put things right. As we sing in Lewis Hensley's hymn from 1864, Thy kingdom come, O God, thy rule, O Christ, begin. Break with thine iron rod the tyrannies of sin. And I have to be honest, I've not sung that hymn before. I don't know that one. I have to look that up when I'm done recording this, but uh, sounds like an interesting one. Lewis Hensley is the name of the composer. Um, but I'll read the lyric one more time. Thy kingdom come, O God. Thy rule, O Christ, begin. Yeah, I long for that too. Break with thine iron rod the tyrannies of sin. And that's, yeah, certainly... Another way of saying when he comes back, he intends to set all things right, to do away with every evil there is, to break all the tyrannies of sin. How can we be sure <clears throat> that Christ will come again and come to reign? Because of the historical facts of his first coming and the unambiguous promise of God. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And I remember that from Acts chapter 1. Uh, verse 11, uh, the angels are standing there with the, some of the disciples of Jesus. 
And the, uh, Jesus then uh, is, is literally taken up into the heavenly realm. And what that looked like, I could not begin to tell you. Um, but they use the word up. Uh, I suppose it meant he went up into the clouds. And so if that's the case, they saw him visibly and it wasn't a hallucination and it wasn't, a, you know, if that's what really happened and these angels then say, the one who's been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go up into heaven. So he'll come back. It'll be personal. It'll be physical. It'll be glorious. It'll be undeniable. Ah, that's good news. In other words, we ground our hope for what God will do in the future on our knowledge of what he has done in the past. And that's so right and proper, isn't it? Faithfulness, God's faithfulness to us, his generosity to us, his grace toward us, his wisdom on offer to us through his word. All of that reminds us over and over and over again that this is a God that can be trusted. This is a God who's powerful enough to actually defeat our last and greatest enemy, death. This is a God that holds human history in his hands. And there's nothing in our little slice of space-time history that daunts God in any way or will stop his purposes from being unfolded and accomplished. It was exactly the same for Old Testament Israel. Uh, Wright and Stott together remind us over and over again. We saw last week, and that's if you read this, in the book of Exodus, how that great event became the foundation of Israel's faith and expectations from God forever after. If God could do that, and he did, then God can surely do this, whatever the need might be in personal or national life. As the centuries went by, the prophets of Israel began to look forward to a climactic moment of future salvation for which only Exodus language was adequate. There would be a new Exodus, a new deliverance, if you will, okay? A new defeat of God's enemies, a new uh, way through the wilderness. Oh, hallelujah. That's, I'm, now I'm starting to get really, this is going to make a good day, I think, keeping this in mind here, isn't it? Yeah. So when God came again in the person of the incarnate Son of God, it was the fulfillment of a wide range of scriptural promises. We shall sample just a few of those this week to illustrate our subtitle, Advent in All of the Scriptures. And so if you, if you want to stay with that, because I'll probably float around in some of my other books, that's the book you want to grab, though. You can get it online, I'm sure. Okay, Um, but they're going to sample a few of those throughout the week to illustrate the subtitle Advent and all the scriptures. God's coming, that's what Advent means, his appearance or his arrival, his coming, Uh, whether as a past fact to be celebrated or as a future event to be expected is woven throughout the entire Bible. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is true. That's exactly right. And if God is who he said he is, if God is able to do what he has been able to do in the past, if God is this same God from Genesis 1-1 that we'll be studying in a few weeks' time, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If he's able to do all of that out of nothing, then he can certainly push around some of the stuff he's created and make it right someday. And I'm so looking forward to him doing that. First of all, however, we begin the week of devotions again with a psalm in which David remembers how God has given him a desperately needed personal exodus. He then turns that experience into testimony and challenge and finally longs for God to come and do the same again. He had waited before and been answered. Now he is waiting again. And I'll tell you what, since... I've just read that, and he's referencing that psalm. Tomorrow, we'll read that psalm together, Psalm 40, and uh, read from this devotional. But here's a prayer for today. Almighty God, who sent your servant John the Baptist to prepare your people for the coming of your son. We studied that, didn't we, just this past Sunday. It was so amazing. The angel appearing to Zacharias and Elizabeth saying, you're going to have a son. His name's going to be John. That's exactly who the this prayer, you know, or, or who they were talking about, John the Baptist. I love this. You sent your servant John the Baptist to prepare your people for the coming of your son. Inspire us now, the ministers and stewards of your truth. And that's who we are in this day and age, folks. You are a steward of the gospel, a minister, a servant, if you will. Yeah. That when he comes again, back to our prayer, in glory, we may stand with confidence before him as our judge, who is alive, 
and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen and amen. I hope you'll make plans to join me tomorrow for Psalm 40 from this book. And uh, and and down at the bottom there, uh, pass that along to somebody else and invite them to join us. Grab a cup of coffee and a kolache or something and join me. I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. God bless. Daily Devotions with Pastor Jim Thomas is a resource of the Village Chapel in Nashville, Tennessee. If you find this daily devotional beneficial, leave a review and share it with friends and family. For more resources or to support our ministry, visit our website, thevillagechapel.com. Artwork for this podcast by Kim Thomas. Music by Phil Kagey.